I'm here to talk about the C word. And the C word is not Christmas, although I just, all of you who cook, I want to share with something incredibly middle class that I did yesterday was that I was in bed reading Country Living. <laughs> and uh, as you do, and um, I saw a recipe for roasting turkey and between the skin and the bird, and I want you all to go home and try this, you put brandy butter. Have you ever, I've never thought of doing that. I think it's really extraordinary. Um, <laughs> anyway, clients, we all have them. Um, some of us have more than others. Um, some of them we love, some of them completely screw us up. Um, over the years, and I've been doing this game for a very, very, very long time, um, like 40 years, which I'm a chartered accountant that found something different to do in life. Um, I worked out that I've done possibly, or been involved in about 11,000 events. And that is enough for anybody to have done. And over the years, I've, um, when I started out, there was no competition. Um, the speakers before were saying how competition has grown and grown and grown. When I started out, there was Liz Anson. Do you all know who Liz Anson is? You know, she's the woman that founded the whole thing. Without her and um, Ken Turner, we'd have no florists and no, par no party organisers. Um, there was um, her and Peregrine Armstrong Jones and William Bartholomew and me. That's all there was. And um, so clients would come to you and they would ask you to do their, I don't know, their bar mitzvah, their bat mitzvah, their weddings, their funerals, whatever. I've, I've nailed quite a lot of people down in their boxes in a very expensive way. Um, there was no competition. So I would, would just sort of sit down. My big thing is that people ask where you get your inspiration from. I personally um, pour a very hot bath and I make a very, very strong gin and tonic. And I get into that bath and I let my head go. And God knows what goes on in my head, but it seems to go on. And really, at my age, I should be sitting in a chair dribbling. Um, <laughs> but I have absolutely, I'm 70. Yeah, 70. And I'm going to tell you something about that in a minute, about clients and being one's own client. I'll tell you that in a second. Um, but I have no intention of stopping. I think that we're all incredibly lucky. We're in a business. There was a very famous man who Jean Charles will remember in Paris called Pierre Silohan. And Pierre Silohan was a great, great party organizer. And he would be still doing it at 84. You know, they've wheeled him out. And they can put us all into a wheelchair. And as long as you can be charming and not fall over, I think you have a pretty good chance of still making a living at it. Um, the question is, do we want our clients? Do you want all the clients that come to you? No. I look at some of them and they walk through the door and you think, oh my God. <laughs> and it will be absolutely typical that the ones that you think, oh my God, they're the ones that go, oh, we really love you, we love your ideas, it's so creative. And you make it very, very expensive in the hope that they're not going to take you. And the ones that you're desperate to work with go, oh, well, you know, we don't have the money. And, and, the, one, and the other ones will say, yes, yes, whatever it wants. Pay, 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 pay. Um, and in the old days, I used to own a thing called the Admirable Crichton, in case you don't know. And I um, think there should be a road. I'm going to tell you about this in a minute. There should be a road down the back of Bond Street which was called Crichton Way. I opened, and I have to say closed, more shops on Bond Street than any other living human being. There isn't a luxury brand in the world that I haven't worked for. And those luxury brands are all peopled by, you know those girls, uh, no, and boys, and boys, not being sexist, but often I seem to deal with girls. They were always dressed in black, and they were always very, very super skinny and they would spend hours agonizing over the size of a canopy and the size of the lucite tray on which you were going to serve this food. Gucci were famous for that. They had their shoes on um, plexiglass plinths and they would say, now this is what we want, but it's just got to be that thick. And all you have to do is put your coat hanger in your mouth and smile and say it's all going to be fine. 
But those were the people, and it's still exactly the same. That is the way it works. Um, I'm just going to stop for a second and tell you a little bit about this client. This client was a Saudi princess, and she came to me and said, um, I want a wedding, but I don't want it to be in a big flash setting. We'd done her sister's wedding at Hampton Court, which was enormous. More flowers, more blah, blah, blah than you could possibly imagine. We set the thing up for 600 people. In quite a depressing way, 200 people rocked up, and they had spent the national debt and then some. And so she said to me, I want you to find me a ruined cathedral. She was marrying a man who was Christian, who then converted to um, Islam. And see, it was quite random that they wanted a cathedral because they were neither of them at this stage Christian, but we found this place. It had to be within 40 minutes of a city that they could fly from Jeddah to. So I went round and I looked at all kinds of spaces. And then finally, we came up with, and this, I'm going to show you a video at the end of this. Um, we came up with this extraordinary ruin. And it really was ruined. Quite a lot of it was completely unsafe. Um, and we built this structure inside it. But what we weren't allowed to do, we weren't allowed to touch any of the walls of the cathedral. But she wanted her guests to be able to touch them. And so that meant that if the weather wasn't so good, there was a gap. So we built this thing. The, the structure itself inside was all custom built. It cost a million euros and looked amazing. And um, the mother, who was absolutely lovely, they're the ch most charming, charming people. They came three days before the sun was out. It all looked perfect. And um, they were, in fact, she cried. Lovely. Um, and on the Thursday, the heavens opened. And they didn't just open, they just poured. I don't know if you could, you can't, perhaps can't see here. Yes, you can. You see those cypress trees? We had to build the structure around the cypress trees. So as the rain came, it went down the trees, down onto the carpet. The carpets were soaking wet. We did a lighting test the night before, and um, we had no generators. She said to me, it's jolly cold in here, Johnny. And I said, well, we've got no power. And then she said to me, there are a few drips of water coming through the ceiling. I said, have you not noticed the waterfalls that are going down the side of this thing, and the fact that if we had mustard and cress seeds, we could chuck them on the carpet, and we could grow them. I'm not deeply religious. This was Easter Friday, Good Friday. And there was a part of, this, of the um, structure that was out here which had no cover over it. And it, we put sand down to protect the floor. And I dropped a knife. And I bent down and I picked the knife up. But instead of picking up the knife, I picked up a nail. Just, you know, nail. And I thought, that's a sign. I went off into a corner of the cathedral and I got down on my hands and knees and I said, you know what God, you have to turn this tap off and you have to do it in the next two hours. The Almighty was listening, the rain stopped, the next morning dawned beautifully, we recarpeted the place, in fact it was so hot the candles were doing this melting inside it, it was a triumph. That was a client who was very lovely. They had spent several million pounds a bit for their child's wedding. I was thinking the night before that I might well finish up in some sort of bunker in Riyadh. Um, <laughs> but that didn't happen. Anyway, it was all very lovely. And that's, that was how it looked during the day. And they wanted everything very simple. Wooden tables, little flowers, you know, blah, blah, blah. But it did look very beautiful at night. Um, this was also one of my the loveliest brides I've ever, ever, ever dealt with. The child was 18. Um, rain seems to be a common theme in my life. This was at the Chateau de Chantilly, and she was marrying a man who was considerably older than her. She was the most beautiful bride I've ever, ever, ever married. And she came to me 
on the morning of her wedding. Um, and the Chateau de Chantilly has um, water all around it, and um, it, it was just a mess. There was just water everywhere. The carpets were wrecked, blah, blah, blah. She was wearing beautiful cashmere um, suit, and she had her engagement ring, which was a little bigger than this, only it was a single yellow diamond, and her father had given her two as earrings, and she'd had it made into a, a ring. And she looked at me and she said, my wedding is going to be a disaster. And I said, um, I promise you it's not. And I had my hands firmly, my fingers firmly crossed behind my back. And again, I looked at the skies. And 45 minutes later, the sun came out and this child got married. Um, there are lots and lots of people in this room who are very skilled party planners. And I know that you all deal with your clients. And, um, Somebody also asked how you deal with the stress. Do you all get stressed? Yes. Do you wake up at four in the morning going, why did I ever agree to do this job? I do that all the time. And I've been doing it for 40 years. And I've just been doing a, um, a quote for a party about which I have a complete mental block for New Year's Eve. Can't think how to do it. I've, I've thought about it now. Gin, I dry martini this time. Um, and worked out what to do, but it was just, it's so difficult when that happens. My husband sees the signs. <laughs> and it's usually on a Thursday. And he very cleverly, and you all need to find this to get away from your clients. You need to find a space to go where you can be chilled and relaxed and unstressed. And for me, it's Venice. And he books a flight on a Thursday evening and he says, we're just, we're just going to go to Venice for the weekend. Of course, there are no cars, the air is lovely, the sea is great, the food's wonderful. We stay in the same room in the same hotel overlooking the Grand Canal. And by the time I come back on a, um, a Sunday, I'm kind of chilled. I'm chilled until one gets the next telephone call. <laughs> and I think something you need to do when dealing with clients is really establish the parameters. And I think you need to also think about the effect that the clients that you're talking to are going to have on your business. I had a call, um, I don't know, three months ago from a girl who was absolutely charming. She asked me if I would do her wedding. Her parents had block booked the Palace Hotel in St. Moritz. So I'm guessing they're not on the breadline. <laughs> and have you been to the Palace Hotel in St. Moritz? No, it's, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's eye-wateringly expensive. It has um, quite strange rooms in it, but it's, it's just lovely. Anyway, she's, and I'm going to tell you what she asked me to do, and then I want you to tell me if you think I was right or wrong. She said, 250 guests. The first night, I just want to have a little very simple dinner and you understand about the flowers. Um, very simple little dinner, maybe in a local pizza restaurant. Nothing, nothing elaborate. I said, that's fine. And then she said, the next morning, um, I'd like you to, um, to dress the entrance of the Palace Hotel. The entrance of the Palace Hotel is like this, bigger. Um, and then she said, I want to have um, the staircase down which I'm going to walk dressed. And, Forgive me any of the florists in this room, but you know those arrangements of flowers that look like somebody's been sick down the stairs? You know? <laughs> um, I say that because I hate them, but you know, anyway. Um, and so she wanted one of those. Then she wanted to have a table and the joys of Pinterest. The thing you need to remember is that everything you see on Pinterest is already old hat. Somebody's done it. Somebody's dreamt it up, somebody's photographed it, somebody's posted it, somebody has liked it, you know, Gen X and Gen Z, which in my life are teenagers and shouldn't be listened to at all. Um, they've all seen it. And so this girl had this picture of a long winding table going through a meadow. She said, we've got a meadow with wildflowers. I'd love to have it there. Um, and I had to point out to her that those pictures you get, somebody has actually put it all together and faked it. Because if you've got waiting staff laying up a table or putting out a table, 
the flowers are all going to be flattened and it's going to be like wet hay all around. Anyway, that's what she wanted. She wanted me to find the table, the flowers, the chairs, blah, 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 blah. Then she said, I would like you to do the flowers for the ceremony and then I want you to transform the ballroom and I want 250 people to sit down at tables of 10 with flowers, with lighting, with sound. And then there is a very strange nightclub in the Palace Hotel and she wanted me to make it look like Moulin Rouge. Um, I've transformed that room several times and it's a nightmare. Um, and if you work in Switzerland, A, you have to do carnets, which take forever and cost a fortune to do, you know. Everything has to be listed, you take it to Switzerland, you have to bring it back, blah, blah, blah. And if you give your staff a cup of coffee, it's kind of 10 pounds. So normally, I find that people are very reluctant to give you their budgets. They look at you and you say, how much do you want to spend? Oh, I don't know, I don't know. Um, of course they bloody know. You know, if you, if, if you were talking to someone like me and you think that you might conceivably be spending a million pounds on the wedding, the man that's writing the cheque is not some idiot from boho nowhere. He's made a fortune, he's, he's got money, he's as shrewd as they come and he hasn't made his money by being Mr. Nice Guy. And he, of course, has worked out how much he's going to spend. Um, but they, I don't know. Could you just give us a quote? Which, of course, takes you forever. And God forbid we all have to do those renderings and graphics. When you have to employ someone to do it, and then they say, well, it was lovely, but actually we've got somebody else to do it for £50,000 less. Anyway, I asked this girl how much she wanted to spend. And tell me you think I was being unreasonable when I looked a little shocked. She said, my budget is €70,000. So I said, um, shall I press this? You've got something else to look at. That was a lovely tropical party at Fulham Palace. Um, and um, I, said, Sam, I, I said, and you can't tell the woman she's on drugs. <laughs> so she was clearly a la-la land. And I said, um, then have you, have you perhaps missed a naught off the end of this? It was even at 700,000. I didn't think it was that much. Um, and, um, no, 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 no. So then I, I liked her a lot, and sometimes you do things free. Like, I hope you've all been watching Spencer and Vogue's wedding on television, have you? Yeah? yeah. Free. Um, <laughs> but great PR. Um, but um, I then said I would go out and help her. And I quoted £13,000 to go out and help her. And as I did it, I thought, Johnny, you're an idiot. Because the truth is, that if you do that kind of thing and you have contractors that you haven't contracted, you don't know what they're like, you don't know if they're any good or not, and they screw up, you cannot walk around and you all need to be really careful about this. You want to please your clients, you like your clients, but you can't walk around at the end of the day. And it also, the, the other difficulty with, it, with this was that this girl was friend of, friends of very, very rich clients who had recommended her to me. Um, you can't go around and say, I'm sorry, None of this was mine. I didn't actually choose puce flowers. And um, so in the end of the day, mercifully, she couldn't afford to have me, so it didn't happen and blah, blah, blah. But you have got to be very, very, very careful. I am going to just flick through some of these, and then I'm, going to, I'm really going to cop out, which, which I think is awful of me, because you haven't actually come to watch a video about me. But I'm going to show you one anyway, because it's... I know you probably all want to watch. Look, this was so fun. This is uh, in Marrakesh, where we floated um, the orchestra and the dance floor on the pool of the Amman Jaina. And we bought 4,000 lanterns, which, uh, for some inexplicable reason, we brought back to London. But what was lovely here was that they ran, around the edge of the dance floor, we put fresh mint. So in the hot night air, when you danced, you brushed against it and you got the really lovely, lovely smell of mint. And that was the time, you can see it there, it was so fun. We also took over for this client, um, that was full of fireworks, and uh, we took over for this client, um, and that's something else to you about in a minute, um, we took over a, a ruined um, castle, um, and I suddenly realised that we weren't sure whether this thing was safe enough for the people to come out, and all the villagers had dogs, which probably had rabies. And so we finished up taking a structural engineer from Scotland, and we took my vet 
from London. All the dogs were shampooed. They were all inoculated. You couldn't have, you know, a multimillionaire's little girl coming up and say, "Nice doggy," <laughs> um, and then the child dies. That's that's. <laughs> It's never really the, the right way to start a, a weekend, I, I feel. Um, we would never be allowed to do that. Do you know, I hate health and safety. I just, how have I got to 71? I've managed to buy tickets on the, I don't know if I say I've managed to buy tickets on the underground, because I don't travel on the tube, but I have managed to buy airline tickets um, without somebody holding my hand apart from a PA. Um, that's the Natural History Museum. We turned the staircase of the Natural History Museum, which sadly you can't see the water, but out of this African head came huge waterfall going down the staircase. And then we had these naked boys, which is also quite a common theme in my events. Um, <laughs> the, the best one of all was outside Tiffany on Bond Street, where we put boxes. And we had these naked boys on Tiffany boxes sitting with water gushing out between their legs. Do you know what? It stopped the traffic. <laughs> and that's what we're, that's pleasing our clients. That's what we're in, in business to do. And it's all about, something else I just need to say to you is, I tell my hairdresser things that I would probably only tell my doctor. Do you have a strange relationship? It's something to do with sitting, looking in the mirror, seeing how hideous you look in that awful overhead light, as they, and they haven't done your hair yet, so you've just, and it's not so bad for a boy, I suppose, but for, you know, anyway, not ideal. I like my clients. I get on with them really well. I've done the inside measurements of the legs of bridegrooms. I have chosen the pearls that the bride's mother has to wear. I've got them to get somebody to bring a Chanel dress from Paris because they were going to DHL it, and I get someone to ship it over because I can't believe that anybody would just put it in a box. But they're not my friends. In their mind, they love you, they will be charming, but you and I are always staff. And I think it's a huge mistake to have a relationship where you don't have that gap. Because things, things go wrong, and anybody in this room who says they haven't done a party where anything goes wrong is lying. There are always things that go wrong. If you're clever, you wallpaper over it and nobody notices, but sometimes you can't. And the, the woman that you're kissing, who's saying, darling, I love you more than anything, this is so amazing, believe me, if they're spending two or three million pounds on their wedding and it goes wrong, they will turn into rottweilers. And it's then embarrassing. So I always think, be charming with them, be friendly, share things with them, tell them all about your bits and pieces and blah, blah, blah. But always keep that gap between you and your clients. Things that you need to do with your clients, when you give them your quotes, your quotes need to be, these people are rich and they're time poor. They haven't got time to faff through a whole mass of stuff. I have one Saudi princess, I've done nine quotes for her, and it was more elaborate than you can imagine. Her financial controller got hold of it, and he said to me, but her Royal Highness can't possibly spend this amount of money. And I had spent three months on it, and nobody had ever said no. So you need to be certain that you're talking to the person who is paying the bill, that you're talking to them about the budget, that you're talking to them about your terms and conditions, that you get the... The other thing you need to be careful of is there are certain people in this world who agree to your quote, and that you send out the quote, and you send them the deposit invoice. My God, that deposit invoice is in your bank account almost before you've had a cup of coffee. Can I tell you, that is probably the last money you will ever see. You need to be really wary of that. It's the oldest trick, and I have been round the block. I have dealt with every nation under the sun, and there are some people who just, and some people from all countries whose mindset is, Oh, I really like Johnny Roxburgh. I bet you he makes 20%, so he won't pay the last 20%. He won't care, that's his profit. And you just need to be certain. You know the old saying? No ticket, no laundry. You need to get the money in the bank, particularly nowadays, before the job. 
Because if you're doing a big party and you're exposing yourself to maybe five, six, seven hundred thousand pounds for the last 20%, that can put you into liquidation. And, and you need to also be responsible because if you're like me and I take all the risk and I'm paying all the contractors, I would never ever, if something went wrong, I would never ever not pay my contractors. I'd sell my house and Giles and I would go and live on soup on the beach somewhere. You could never look in the mirror in the morning and shave and say, I have fucked over my contractors. And that's something that you just can't do. So you need to make certain that the people that are paying you are paying you properly. Um, that lovely um, client, the only thing that really, um, this is all, all about um, an extraordinary countess in Venice who used to walk through Venice dressed in nothing except a sable coat with two leopards on the end of diamond leads. She was incredibly rich. She spent too much money on parties and finished up bankrupt, but she had a great time. I wish I'd been her, her person doing the parties. Um, you, need, you need to employ people who are um, good at looking after your VAT, your terms and conditions, blah, blah, blah. But you also need to think about how you smell. When I was young, you know those things when you were 15, when you, well, that was a long time ago, I read one of those books, How to Succeed in Business. And of course, 55 years ago, I guess not everybody had a bathroom in their house, I don't know. But this book, every chapter, I remember it so well, finished up saying, wash every day. <laughs> and you're also too young to remember that you used to get on the tube or a bus and there were people with BO that smelt like pea soup. It was absolutely disgusting and really, really, really horrible. I have always been a great fan of personal daintiness. Um, and I try to make myself smell the way I think my clients are going to like me to smell. So when I was doing Spencer and Vogue's wedding, they were late for the first meeting, and I went in, it was in Avery Row, and I went down um, into a little scent shop on Avery Row, and they had this great spray that smelled of oud. I love oud. And so I'm and I came out and the man that ran the shop said, you smell fantastic. And with that, this couple, I'd never met Spencer, but I didn't know them at so I don't watch Made in Chelsea. It was, you know, and this couple came down the, and she turned to me and she is so beautiful, I can't tell you. And she said, do you know what? You do smell beautiful. And I looked at her, the television crew behind her, I guessed who she was. And I said, well, just, just as well, we're about to spend the next 40 minutes together and hopefully you're going to employ me. I then had that same scent and I went to see a client from Dubai in London. And I just, and when I kissed her, she said, oh my God, you smell just like home. And, and that was all subliminal. The other subliminal thing is boys and girls. Don't go to a meeting in a jacket. Go to a meeting in a cashmere pullover. Believe me, they cannot stop touching you. <laughs> Just, and, and, and they do. They cover and they go, choo, 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 choo. Oh, you, you smell lovely and you feel fantastic. Um, and now, that was a party in Madrid. That was a party in, in um, Lake Como, that, that was the most famous party of the natural history ever, ever, ever. It was the launch of Cartier's new shop on Bond Street and they wanted to put a party on in Berkeley Square and I said, don't be so ridiculous, give me the budget and I will make the Natural History Museum look like it's never looked before or since. We had 400 crews standing outside at six o'clock and I blew the whistle and in two hours they transformed the thing. New staircases outside on the street, fountains, all kinds of stuff, a completely new staircase on the, um, as you go into it. This is what I do every year, Dunhill Golf in St Andrews, I transform um, the tent there. That's a very old photograph, but people still love it. It's the, the London Fashion Awards at Billingsgate. They had absolutely no money, and so I hung hundreds and hundreds, thousands of sets of fairy lights on a twinkle machine. A wedding, I've never heard a client turn to his bride and tell his bride, I love you. 
but extraordinary. So with this, we put the fabric, we got the tables were made exactly the width of expensive fabric. We covered it over, and then when it was all finished, we took the fabric off, had it dry cleaned, and the family were given cushions and curtains for all their houses. It was a nice memory. Um, that was a lovely bar, blah, 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 blah. And so it goes on. So it bloody goes on. Um, and um, I don't know. While we're doing the Q&A, if you've got time and you want to ask me anything, um, that was, here's something, that was the Dolder Ground in Zurich. You spend 600 million building a new hotel. 600 million. You build a ballroom and the ballroom is oval. You put the bits that all the um, cables have to go around the ballroom. There's no way for a stage for a start. They hadn't thought that one through. And they made the holes that you put the cables through that size. Spot the deliberate error. The thing that's at the end of the cable is this size. So having spent all that money, you had to put the cables just loose around the room. Anybody want to, to ask me a question? From all the events that you've done, 11,000 events, is there anything that you haven't yet created? Oh, lots. Which lots. Like lots and lots and lots. I'm about to create the most exciting thing of all, which is, um, can I tell? Next year. Yes, you, you'll hear all about my birthday party next year. But my God, can I tell you, that's a guest list that's out of control. 500 people at Spencer House. And, um, and it's been the most difficult thing in the world, picking the people that are coming. Absolutely impossible. And, um, and it's going to be amazing. Thank you very much, John. Thank you.